listeners, we want to tell you about a podcast we're really digging. It's called Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio. Every week, they travel the world to find the most fascinating stories about food, including children who harvest cod tongues after school in Norway and a detective who tracks down food thieves. And on Milk Street Radio, you can always find the unexpected. The comedian who ranks apples using an elaborate 100-point system, the secret history of grocery stores, and how to eat your way through Italy. They also interview the most beloved names in food like Jacques Pepin, Sola Aueli, Jose Andres, Jet Tila, Ina Garten, Nigella Lawson, and Padma Lakshmi. Plus, co-hosts Christopher Kimball and Sarah Moulton do live calls with listeners and answer their questions about ingredients, techniques, and culinary mysteries. Like, why roasting a leg of lamb made one caller's oven explode? Ever wonder why your bread won't rise or your souffle falls flat? Chris and Sarah have the answers. You'll also hear from a rotating cast of contributors, including Kenji Lopez-Alt, Cheryl Day, Dan Pashman from The Sporkful, and Alex Inews, a French guy cooking from YouTube. Take a listen at 177milkstreet.com slash radio, or just search your podcast app for Milk Street Radio. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Just the way that it transforms when you're making it, like from just the liquid to the curds and the whey, I feel like that is such, it's so transformational. And then as the cheese ages and it gets the crystals and the cracks and the different patterns and shapes and like the blue cheese with the veins kind of sneaking through, I like, oh, I just, it's so cool. <laughs> I love cheese. <laughs> When you consider humanity's greatest inventions, you might think about things that dramatically changed our world, like antibiotics or the airplane or currency or language. But me, I think of cheese. As you just heard writer Jennifer Billock say, the transformation of milk is an incredible process. Now, if you're a longtime listener, you may have heard me talk about cheese like a bunch of times. <laughs> I got my start at HRN all the way back in 2019 when I was a cheddar cheese maker. I've since left production, but cheese has not left my heart. So this week, we're bringing you a full-on cheese episode. I'm H. Conley, and this is Meat and Three on HRN. Meat and Three. Meat and Three. Meat and Three. One meat, three sides. Food, news, and storytelling. A square meal. For your ears. Meat and three. Since I started making cheese in 2015, I've wanted to spread the good word that you can do it too. In our first story, Sophia Hooper is going to take us along for her first adventure in amateur cheese making. All right. You're ready? Whenever you're ready. Okay, come. So, I've had this voice in my head that's been telling me to make cheese. You can do it too. That voice is H. Conley's. Make cream cheese. Cream cheese. Oh, it's, it's so easy. So easy. easy. So cream cheese. Much cheese. fun. I love cheese. And it feels so empowering. I can ship you some cream cheese. It takes so Strawberry little work. So cheese. satisfying. I genuinely love cream cheese. I do love cheese. making cream cheese. Cream cheese. Cream cheese. Oh, God. Cream cheese. Really, how could I say no? We were powered more by enthusiasm than actual cheese-making knowledge, but we learned that you don't actually need that. And besides, I just wanted an excuse to mess around in my kitchen. I enlisted my roommate, Jay, and we grabbed a few special ingredients. This is our starter culture. <gasps> no kidding. Cool. Wow. And this is raw milk. From Freeport. Oh, so it's cool. like right up the road. <gasps> <laughs> okay, yeah. There it is. And we got to cheese-making. We did heat up our milk too fast. We're in 86, we're in 87. Get that off, baby. Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, milk kind of weirds me out. It kind of weirds me out, too. I think that's like the temperature that makes the yeast happy. Is it yeast? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand dairy. It's, like- it's bacteria, which is different than yeast. But I'm no scientist. We added our culture packet to the warm milk. Do your magic. 
and put it in a warm spot overnight to separate into curds and whey. That's literally it. See you tomorrow. Bye, babe. Bye. <laughs> Bye, babe. <laughs> And I'm going to check on my cheese before work. And, oh, that smells cheesy, I guess. I don't know about that. Okay. I did not like that noise. At this point, I wrapped my curds in cheesecloth to finish draining and came back to find. So we made almost a pound and a half. <gasps> oh Isn't God. that crazy? <laughs> I wasn't planning to own this much cream cheese. Cheese making is an art and a tradition and a science. But for me, in my apartment kitchen with summer finally in the air, I made cheese for the same reason I used to put food coloring in my mom's vases to turn the white carnations pink or mix up mud and plants and some unfortunate bugs into a slop with my brother in the backyard. I am no better than my five-year-old self. I just like to see the world react to me. Wow. That's actually really cool. A little dill? Mm-hmm. Nice. I could eat that with a spoonful. That's really good. Oh, good. I was worried. It was, <laughs> it was so gross yesterday. No, I was no, no. Like, I think sometimes know. you just have to let it sit. So it'll be remind me my mom's cheese. Mm-hmm. It's good. It's very good. Mm. <laughs> I was so excited. The upside is, we're adults now, and we're capable of making really good slop. But you can still show it off to your family like one of the terrible drawings you made in elementary school, and they will think you are brilliant. Go make some cheese. All right, you heard her, folks. Now, for our next story, we're not going to gain a deeper understanding of cheese. We're hoping cheese can give us a deeper understanding of ourselves. Forget tea leaves and tarot cards. Jessica Gingrich will let the curds guide her way. She's dipping into the dairy aisle for answers to life's biggest questions. The world is complex. Misinformation is everywhere. So where does a girl go for answers? Well, I went to the one thing that I can always count on. Cheese. My name is Jennifer Billock. I'm not psychic. I just am like a medium for the cheese. (laughs) Jennifer is a cheese whiz, literally. She's a modern day practitioner of tyromancy, the ancient art of cheese fortune telling. Today, she's reading a cheese board like a crystal ball, each wedge a window into my past, present, and future. To divine my destiny, she'll be looking for holes, colors, mold veins, anything like that. To fully appreciate these curds of wisdom, let's first dive into the history of Tyromancy. The first recorded mention of it was in a second century book by Artemidorus of Daldus. He suggested that people who divine from cheese are sullying the work of the real diviners. Back in the day, cheese making was a mysterious craft, mainly practiced by women. Superstition, sexism, and a general lack of scientific knowledge led many to associate cheese making and tyromancy with witchcraft. So the practice curdled and went on its way by the late 1600s. You don't want to be gazing into a cheese ball and have someone be like, witch, witch, grill her cheese. But here I am, centuries later, anxiously waiting for Jennifer to grill me with cheese. So I'm going to have you pick a cheese for your past. What about the Gouda? It's got a big ridge kind of going through the middle of it. That's like a journey line. It will say that it is kind of a rocky road, so it was not without its challenges. (laughs) And the reason that I say that is because both sides kind of have it falling down with like a bunch of crumbles. (laughs) Hopefully I'll have better luck in the present with garlic cheddar. Got a line across the bottom. That line is kind of like your foundation line and the pitchfork through it is maybe a little bit of uncertainty for you. First a crumbly past and now a pitchforked present. Looks like I'm not the sharpest cheddar in the drawer. Let's see what the goat cheese holds for my future. I cut this piece for you and it is kind of falling apart. Oop, just fell apart (laughs) because I mean, it's goat cheese, but... (laughs) My future is literally in your hand (laughs) and you dropped it. So part of it falling off, it's kind of an indicator of making a bad choice in the future. You look so scared. (laughs) Scared? Yeah. My life is literally crumbling before my eyes. But 
there was hope in a little upward arrow where the cheese broke off. It's a cheese of learning. It's learning how you can take a situation that didn't quite work out how you wanted it to and move forward with it. So basically, I'm on a lactose learning curve. But hey, at least I'm not moldy. Yet. Your past cheese was kind of like a little bit of a warning, but your present cheese is very much like a celebrating your creativity and your ingenuity. And your future cheese, it's showing that you learn from everything. So even though something might have gone wrong, you have taken all of this knowledge and you've taken it to a bigger, better place. It's comforting to know that even when things fall apart, there's always room for growth and a better cheese plate ahead. But for now, I'm off to find a wine pairing for my destiny. We'll be right back with more Meet and 3 after a brief break. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. The Hearst family has been raising cattle on the rich, sustainable native grasslands of California's Central Coast for over 150 years. Piedra Blanca Rancho in San Simeon is the original Hearst Ranch, founded by George Hearst in 1865. George's son was the famous publisher, William Randolph Hearst. In addition to being known for building the iconic Hearst Castle, William was, like his father before him, an avid rancher. In his words, I would rather spend a month at the ranch than any place in the world. Thanks to one of the largest land conservation easements in California history, a joint effort with the California Rangeland Trust, the American Land Conservancy, and the state of California, the working landscape at Hearst Ranch will be preserved forever. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at HearstRanch.com. Welcome back to Meet in Three. We're bringing you to the Midwest for this story to enjoy a Wisconsin delicacy. Squeaky, salty, and undeniably addictive, Hannah Chouinard and Toby Cicchini dive into the world of cheese curds. They explore their history, their hype, and the Heartland's deep-rooted connection to them. Hear that? That's the squeak of a curd of cheddar straight from the way. Cheese curds are a staple in Wisconsin. These little lumps can be found at most bars and farmer's markets. Since leaving the state, though, I've learned that they aren't so ubiquitous everywhere. Most of my friends have never tried or even heard of these mounds of umami, so I asked a fellow Wisconsinite and cheese connoisseur, Toby Cicchini, what exactly is a cheese curd? So a cheese curd is very, very fresh, young um, cheese that's not quite fully formed. And in Wisconsin, you always judge it by it has to be squeaky, right? It has to squeak. It still has a fair amount of whey in it, and it's squeaky and um, very sharp and fresh. Like many Midwestern foods, the love of cheese curds goes back to industry, poverty, and ingenuity. Dairy farmers are said to have taken unused curds home to feed their families at the end of a long day of work. The history of cheese and the history of curds are tightly interwoven. So it's no wonder they're a mainstay in Wisconsin, long the top dairy producer in the country. While the state has been dethroned, the affinity for cheese and curd remains. But not everyone in the country feels the same. Is also one of those things that people outside of Wisconsin are literally unaware of. Like, wait, what? What is that? I don't even know what a cheese curd is. What is that? Toby has been running Long Island Bar, a Brooklyn tavern, since 2014. While it's not exactly Wisconsin-themed, Toby leans into his roots. There's this sort of like tongue-in-cheek Wisconsin joke vibe going on, very low simmering in the background. I have little Wisconsin things there, little decals on the window and little uh, ceramic vessels and this and that, little packers, paraphernalia and paintings and whatnot. The atmosphere of a real Midwestern tavern can't be replicated, but Toby did his best to capture its essence. The space is low lit, the bartenders are grumpy, the food is approachable, and like any good Wisconsin tavern, the star of the show is our beloved cheese curd. I just sort of focused on fried cheese curds because A, I love them. Every, you know, people don't know what they are and then they try them and they're like, oh my Lord. 
this is amazing because they are amazing. Toby seems proud to be introducing New York to cheese curds. These heavenly morsels have mass appeal, and they're a great addition to a menu full of amazing food. But they're more than that, too. For those from the East Coast, cheese curds are a small window into a place they likely know nothing about. For Midwestern transplants, like me, they're a reminder that we're not alone in this great big city. For our last story, let's head down to Mexico City with Danielle Flitter. She'll take us through the colonial origins and today's artisans continuing the rich tradition of Mexican cheese. Come to Mexico, eat cheese. That's Jessica Fernandez Lopez. She's a cheesemonger at Latography, an artisan cheese shop in Mexico City. Latography has been promoting the Mexican cheese industry and small local producers for over a decade. I visited their shop in Mexico City and tasted cheeses from various regions. I love the spicy smoked quesillo from Tabasco and the tangy doble crema from Chiapas. These cheeses had deliciously rich and acidic flavors, notably different from the more popular fresh cheeses of quesillo, panela, and requesón. Mexican cheeses are as diverse as the country itself. Served on nearly every dish, Mexican cheeses crumble, sprinkle, and melt over quesadillas, tlayudas, tortas, and chilequiles. You'll find cheese being sold in the established mercados, at every tianguis, and at snack carts on street corners. My favorite part is how every vendor always encourages you to taste a piece before buying it. They'll nod their head in agreement and smile wide while you chew into cheesy bliss. The University of Chipingo has done extensive research on Mexican cheese and identified 60 traditional Mexican cheeses. However, 20 of them have been lost in history. These cheeses are not being made anymore, but there's also no one that remembers how they're made. And so that means that we have lost them completely. And so there are, you know, we really need to share the 40 cheeses that we still have because they're going to go away if we don't start eating them. Carlos Yescas is the founder of Litography. He was featured on an episode of Cooking in Mexican from A to Z. Cheese and dairy were not part of the pre-colonial Mesoamerican diet. The Spanish introduced dairy animals and cheese to Mexico during colonization. The first cheese that appears in Mexico is in Puebla, and it is made with sheep's milk, so closer to a manchego from from Spain. The, The indigenous peoples of Mexico we're lactose intolerant. So it took a long time for the indigenous peoples to actually start um, developing a tolerance for dairy and a liking for, for dairy. Since then, immigrants from Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, France, and Lebanon greatly influenced Mexican gastronomy, including introducing new ways to make cheese. These recipes were then adapted and incorporated into the cheesescape of Mexico. That's why I'm not that purist, and we are, I'm not saying like, oh, it's not traditional. But what is traditional? Like Mexican food is not pre-Hispanic food. Mm-hmm. It's not food that was being made 2,000 years ago. It's, it's unrealistic to think that way. While production techniques for cheese came from around the world to Mexico, Jessica points out that the key to these cheeses are the places that they're made. It's about the milk, the type of cow, the same draining table that's been in the family for 60 years. Um, the bacteria that is floating in the air, the dryness of the soil, the quality of the rainwater. While cheeses are cherished within Mexico, I hadn't seen these delicious varieties sold in the States. It turns out that there are strict regulations on exporting raw milk products to America, and many of the best Mexican cheeses are made with raw milk. This is a real challenge that deprives us of delicious raw milk cheeses from around the world. However, regarding Mexico, Carlos says the FDA is racist, full on racist. It has created all sorts of loopholes and rules and everything. So not no single dairy product can come from Mexico. That is not the same for other countries in Latin America, because there's no reason why Mexico that has a very good production of milk um, cannot enter with its products to the United States. 
While these restrictions and bias limit the export of Mexican-made cheeses to the States, Latography is making a name for Mexican cheeses globally. In April of this year, they represented Mexico again at the World Cheese Awards in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and proudly won nine medals. For me, the most valuable thing is giving the news to the cheesemaker. It's a very hard job. It's very hard to make cheese. But when you tell the news to these small producers that you have 10 cows, that's a woman, hey, you just want a silver for a Mexican traditional cheese. It's like, that's what is important for us. I know the press is important and I really like to, to see like the cheese being sold more because it's helpful for them. Mm-hmm. But I think the recognition of saying yeah, like, yeah, your, your cheese is world class. And it's a, you should be proud of what you're making. Like, please don't stop making it. There is value in preserving food culture and traditions. It roots us to our history, builds community, grows economies, and satisfies palates. Mexico has a proud tradition of supporting local producers and purveyors, and you can taste it in every bite. So plan that trip to Mexico to taste the cheese. That's our show. Thanks for listening. Learn more about the guests and topics we touched on this week by checking out our show notes. This episode of Meet and 3 was reported by Sophia Hooper, Daniel Flitter, Jessica Gingrich, and Hannah Chenard. Our lead producer on this episode was Hannah Chenard, with support from Jessica Gingrich. Meet and 3 is produced by Taylor Early and me, H. Conley. I also audio engineered this episode. Our theme song was composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Meet and 3 is powered by Simplecast. Meet and 3 is a production of Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org and follow us at heritage underscore radio. And please stay in touch. Whether you have a story idea or just like to say hey, write us at ideas at meetin3.nyc. That's all spelled out.